So welcome everybody. Um, we will start the webinar in just a few minutes. On your screen, you will see a poll. So please start filling that. And uh, once you've filled in the poll, please also use the chat to introduce yourselves because this webinar is all about you and interacting with you. So really like to know who we have in the room. We will give it just um, two more minutes for people that are joining the webinar. And, and then we will get started. So good morning for everybody in the Americas. Good evening for those in Asia Pacific. And good day for those in Africa and Europe. So please be reminded, I see people are starting to introduce themselves. That's great. Nice to see we, we have here. Please be reminded to select everyone when you write in the chat. Otherwise, only the host will see your message. So perfect. We will just wait one more minute and then we will get started with the webinar. So welcome, people are joining, that is great, great, Nigeria, Germany, all these different places, great, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, Giampaolo, um, please check your screen, uh, we can see the, okay, thank you. Thank you, so please fill in the poll so we can know a little bit more about all the people in the room. And in a few minutes, we will get started and um, we will see who's with us today. Please be reminded in the chat to select everyone when you type so that we can all see your introductions. Wonderful. Okay, so let us get started as people are still introducing themselves. So welcome everybody. Today's webinar learning from experiences to increase forest data and transparency for climate action. My name is Lisa Schweitzer, and I'm here the author and I work with the National Forest Monitoring Team at FAO, and I will be your moderator for today. So, some quick housekeeping um, on, on the Zoom format of this webinar. You will notice that your microphones are muted. So that is to minimize audio problems as we're many today. So um, but that doesn't mean we do not want to interact with you. That's actually what this webinar is all about. So please use the chat for introducing yourself as many people are doing already. And as you have questions going along through the webinar, please use the Q&A. You will see there's a chat box and there's a Q&A box. Please use the Q&A for any questions you might have. And if the question is directed to someone in specific, please let us know. So great, so we can now be closing the poll and uh, perhaps we could see the results on screen. There we go. So who we have with us today, a lot of government people, wonderful university research and many more that looks wonderful. Then we have a lot of Africa, Asia, Oceania. Okay, it's very late, sorry about that. Uh, but you can see the recording and Latin America, great. All right. And then we almost have a gender balance, a few more male participants. Wonderful, so wonderful to see you all and wonderful to, um, to see all these, uh, who we have in, in our virtual room today. So in this webinar, uh, we will have one presentation, which will be followed by a 30 minute panel discussion with high level speakers from representatives of the Global Environment Facility of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as representatives of four countries. We have with us today, Cote d'Ivoire, Guatemala, Thailand, and Uganda. So you can see on this very nice slide, you can see all speakers that we will have uh, with us today. So after the panel discussion, uh, we will have 20 minutes for question and answers. And that's where we'd really like to hear from you. 
We will be answering to all questions, but we will not be able to take all questions um, in, in, um, in speaking. We will try to answer some of the questions also in writing. So in total, this webinar will last for one and a half hours and afterwards we will be sharing the recordings with you. So this is a knowledge sharing webinar for the, the project Building Global Capacity to Increase Transparency in the Forest Sector. So this CIBID Forest is a two and a half year project implemented through FAO's Global Forest Resources Assessment and the National Forest Monitoring Teams and its partners. It's financed by the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, or CIBIT Trust Fund of the GEF. So CIBIT aims to strengthen the capacity of developing countries to collect, analyze, and disseminate forest-related data to make forest data transparent and accessible in line with the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement. So thanks again for joining us and finding some times in, in your busy schedules today. So what we will do today is first present and discuss the main results and outcomes of the CIBIT Forest Project. We will share knowledge and experience from the pilot countries participating in the project, and we will launch the publication towards open and transparent forest data for climate action, experiences and lessons learned. So this session will be in English with simultaneous translation in Spanish and French. So you can switch to the Spanish and French channel by clicking the globe shaped icon that you should see at the bottom of your Zoom window. Entonces, si quieren escuchar, escuchar este webinario en español en la parte inferior. If you want to listen in Spanish, then at the bottom of your screen, you have the globe icon and you can click on that to listen in Spanish with Spanish simultaneous interpretation. If you'd like to listen in French, then at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the globe icon. You can click on that and you can select the language that you would like to listen to so that you can have simultaneous interpretation into French. Bertraki, Christina, thank you for being with us today. Who's the leader of the FAO eLearning Academy? Christina, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Mar Mareke. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you all for joining us and welcome to this webinar. Um, in this webinar, FAO would like, uh, together with uh, our partners, the, the Global Environment Facility and the United uh, Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we, what we would like to do is to share with you all uh, the outcomes of the project on forest uh, data transparency and also our joint uh, experience in the implementation. So um, the first thing I wanted to mention is that despite all the challenges, also it was during also the, the, the in the middle of a pandemic. So despite all the challenges, the, the, the project was extremely successful and actually uh, member countries uh, really expressed their, their satisfaction. But, uh, and actually I have to say that uh, the various ch uh, challenges of the project have, have actually, um, uh, allowed us to explore new, um, to basically explore new ways in, uh, to innovate in, in our uh, basically delivery. So um, as you know, uh, language remains a barrier for learning and we have done a huge effort to try to design and develop uh, the course on forest uh, transparency and then adapt it and localize it in six languages uh, in a very short time frame. So in, we have it now, it's available in English, in French, in Spanish, in Arabic, uh, in Chinese and in Russian. And this was actually, uh, we have done this only for one other course, but to be able to have them in six languages and we also have the course uh, in six languages and also in a downloadable format so that countries with connectivity challenges have the possibility to download the, the course and do it offline, basically. Um, we have also implemented the digital badge certification system, which is a system that certifies uh, the acquisition of competences. It allows professionals to progress talents within organization and also to increase 
employment opportunities, and we have done the certification system in six languages. And this was also very, very challenges, and it was never done before. Um, we have also uh, created a downloadable package of the entire course content, uh, which is available in printable format, which means that anybody who would like to do and do a and organize a, a training workshop, uh, a face-to-face -face intervention, can download the package and just have all the materials ready. Um, we have then, uh, we have also uh, designed and developed uh, and also delivered a massive open online course on forest transparency. And this was done simultaneously in three languages with the certification done in three languages and the MOOC was delivered three times. And, um, and this was also very uh, challenging. And this was also something that we had never done before. So this has also allowed us to innovate uh, in, in this sense. And um, so uh, as you know, MOOCs are, are very powerful uh, capacity development intervention. They allow to scale up learning experiences and they, they allow uh, skills and competences acquisition, but they are time bound. So in order to share the content of the MOOC and allow countries to adopt the methodology that we have used and also adapt the content to their local context, we have transferred the MOOC uh, in three languages and made it available through the FAO eLearning Academy. So basically, uh, anyone at any time can have access to that. And that also was never done before. So um, I would like to conclude uh, by thanking our partners, uh, Jeff and uh, UNFCCC, who, have, who are also joining us today. I'd like to thank them for their support and collaboration uh, throughout the project and for giving us the opportunity also of bringing innovation in our learning solutions for the benefit of, of member countries. Thank you all very much for your time and your attention. And I'd like to give back the floor to uh, Marika. Thank you very much, Christina. That sounds like a great resource. So everybody take advantage of that. Wonderful. Um, please be reminded again that uh, during this, this presentations, all the presentations and the panel discussions, uh, do pose your questions in the Q&A. Uh, and my colleague, Anatoly, uh, we'll, we'll be selecting the, the questions. And also, you can help her by indicating who your question is, is um, directed to. So our next speaker of today is uh, Julian Fox, who will be making some introductory remarks. So Julian is a team leader of the National Forest Monitoring Team in the Forestry Division in FAO. Thanks, Julian, for being here, and over to you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. It's one of a series organized by the FAO eLearning Academy. Thank you, Christina, for the excellent collaboration at Greenium and the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. I would also like to acknowledge the Jeff and the UNFCCC for the long lasting collaboration and for joining us on today's panel. Today's webinar will highlight key experiences and lessons learned from implementing the Sibit Forest Project. The Sibit Forest Project has built upon FAO's country experiences and networks to further strengthen forest inventories and forest monitoring, provide better reliable data and increase reporting and transparency. And its support for increased transparency in the forestry sector could not be timelier. Starting in 2024, as part of the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement, all countries who have ratified the Paris Agreement will follow a single common transparency process. These reporting requirements outlined in the enhanced transparency framework are universally applicable, thanks to the built-in flexibility that characterizes it. To prepare for the implementation of the enhanced transparency framework, Sibit Forest has supported developing countries through capacity development, knowledge sharing activities aimed at strengthening the collection, interpretation and reporting of forest information. Over the last 10 years, FAO has proudly helped more than 50 countries obtain reliable data through the establishment and strengthening of national forest monitoring systems. 
As described in the Enhanced Transparency Framework, the collection of consistent data provides a solid foundation for reporting forest emissions and removals and for tracking progress on nationally determined contributions. Additionally, national forest monitoring systems can provide countries with the ability to respond to their own forest data needs. And with robust data, countries can inform climate policy and improve the sustainable management of their forest resource. National forest monitoring systems collect forest related information in two ways, through national forest inventories and through using remote sensing tools. Open Forest, CEPAL, and the Framework for Ecosystem Restoration Monitoring are among the platforms developed by FAO that make the collection, analysis, and reporting of forest data easier and more efficient than ever before. The Sibit Forest Project has been helpful in promoting several of these tools and their importance for increasing forest data transparency. In particular, Sibit Forest has helped provide forestry technicians with the proper tools and training for data collection and analysis a crucial step in the development of consistent and reliable monitoring and reporting. The knowledge, material and workshops developed by Sibit Forest have provided great opportunities for capacity development and improved regional and international knowledge sharing and networking. Looking back on the project, which finishes this year, Sibit Forest has conducted many successful events, developed learning materials and the forest and has strengthened forest and climate networks. With lessons learned and insights gained, from our pilot countries, which we are very grateful to have us on the panel today, practitioners can, can, can continue to help prepare countries for the enhanced transparency framework reporting requirements. Thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your engagement and we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session and congratulations colleagues on the really successful Sibit Forest project. Back to you, Marieke. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julian. Sounds very exciting, all this open source material. Um, okay, so the next speaker is uh, Rocio Condor. So Rocio is a forestry officer leading the Global Civit Forest Project. She's coordinating activities to make forest data more transparent and accessible in the context of the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Thanks for being with us today, uh, Rocio. Over to you. Thank you, Marike and Julian, for your kind words and for reminding us uh, preparations must be made by 2024 to support implementation of the Paris Agreement. I also want to thank our participants and panelists for joining us on this special day as we share experiences and lessons learned. As you will all learn more uh, about the CBIT Forest Project, uh, supported coordinated global, regional and national efforts to step up uh, developing countries' abilities to collect, analyze and disseminate forest related data in line with the transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. These efforts to boost institutional and technical capacities along with increased knowledge sharing and awareness raising comprise the main components of CBIT forest. Launch Globally, in 2020, CBIT Forest has accomplished a great deal in past two years. More than 9,000 individuals from around the world benefited from project activities. And this figures refers to the total sum of participation, encompassing everything from pilot country work activities to webinars and virtual training and knowledge sharing activities. Notably, of these 9,000 participants, 38% were women a promising indicator of women's participation and empowerment in forest monitoring. Similarly, our outreach products garner significant participation with practitioners and experts accessing CBIT's outreach and dissemination products over 80, 80,000 times. More statistics like this, as well as breakdowns of the numbers can be found in the project's two-year number infographic. Such a statistics are what we today call end results, but they are actually building blocks for learning and growth. The publication we are launching today towards open and transparent data for climate action, experiences and lessons learned, highlights experiences and knowledge acquired at the national, regional and global levels. 
open data can help meet global challenges such as poverty, hunger, climate change. Um, I was just saying that open data can help uh, meet global challenges as poverty, hunger, climate change, and inequality. Uh, and the project has actually worked with two resources for global sharing of forest related data. Upgrading the FAO's Global Forest Resources Assessment Platform, which is now for the first time ever available to so as documented in the publication open data can be catalyst of collaborative climate solution and can help to promote informed policy making driven by up to date data since national forest monitoring is largely financed by taxpayers open data strengths public trust in forest and climate policy Open data makes the decision-making process more transparent and public services more efficient and effective. Addressing the concerns of data producers to overcome obstacles to sharing will be fundamental in the coming years. Building the foundations of trust and transparency, data producers can accelerate this release of open data. However, particularly in the forest sector, a lack of initial data hosting infrastructure is often a deterrent. The need for comprehensive legal arrangement will help create well-structured, open and transparent sharing of forest data. Interestingly, in the path of obtaining this insight has not been a straight line. Although presenting its own challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic provides opportunities for us to explore new modalities for carrying out project activities. Adapting as we went, the project shifted from in-person to virtual activities, which broadened our global outreach and enabled us to exceed many of our goals. And as Christina mentioned at the beginning, Due to this shift, we were able uh, to deliver three editions of a massive open online course, a self-paced e-learning course in six languages. Six country case studies were also launched under the projects, which were effectively used as tools for training and knowledge sharing. And the project also founded the creation of a series of a national forest inventory e-learning models. As you know, national forest inventories are key for climate. Um, as you know, national forest inventories are key for climate reporting and now learning about national forest inventory is more accessible than ever before. We have developed a national forest monitoring system assessment tool to identify needs and gaps for strengthening forest monitoring to enhance transparency of forest related climate reporting. And not including today's international webinars, CBIT Forest hosted 16 global webinars in two years. CBIT Forest aimed to connect region forest reporting actors by regions. The publication touches on the project's efforts to facilitate regional dialogues in Central America, Mexico, Southeast Asia, Western and Central Africa, aiming to increase awareness of FAO's global forest resources assessment reporting process and its linkages to other reporting processes, and to strengthen information exchange between the focal points, mainly the ones for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the project also supported Latin America, the Caribbean National Forest Inventory Network, and the publication showcase here evidences the advantage of regional networks. 21 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean collaborated to produce for the first time this book on harmonizing the elements of the National Forest Inventory. Regional consistency in data collection and analysis results in reliable and comparable data and improves not only regional, but national and international data reporting. Focusing also on the national level, the publication provides insight into the experiences with pilot countries aiming to enhance their national forest monitoring system. And we will hear from Brazil, Cote d'Ivoire, 
Guatemala, Honduras, Laos, Thailand, and Uganda. Getting ready to collect and apply all the recommendations and lessons learned gathered during the project's implementation, we will keep enhancing accessibility and usability of global forest-related data, developing institutional and technical capacities, sharing knowledge, and cementing networks with the optic to contribute to the implementation of the transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. I encourage all of you to take a more in-depth look at this publication and to share it with your networks. And I urge you all to engage others in efforts to increase open and transparent data, particularly women and youth people who represent an untaped vein of potential and who will be vital in building a peaceful and better tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rocio, that you managed to deliver this presentation despite the connectivity issues. That's a, that's a challenge we are simply facing in, in this, uh, this period. Okay, so now it's time for our panel discussion. So we are going to hear from climate and forestry experts from Uganda, Thailand, Cote d'Ivoire and Guatemala, who are going to share their experience on the actions that, that they have been, that have been taken by their countries to improve their reporting over time. We also have the opportunity to discuss with experts from the GEF and the UNFCCC secretariats. So as we go along, I will be introducing um, each panelist. So the four countries we have with us today are, of course, parties to the Paris Agreement, and they have experience under measuring reporting and verification, uh, which they are going to share with us. So this will be interesting to hear about the diverse experience in these four countries and how forest monitoring contributes and has contributed to the reporting on forest climate action. Thank you very much for being with us today. The panel said discussion will take uh, 30 minutes. And again, uh, please go ahead and pop your questions into the Q&A. Um, and we'll either respond um, uh, in written or uh, live. So first I have one question, which I will ask one by one to all the, question, the, the countries here present with us today. So of course, it's, it's a great thing to have better data on forest, to have more transparency and a better understanding of how forests can contribute to climate action. But in practical terms, how does your country benefit from the better data? So let me first invite Mr. Bob Kazungu from Uganda to answer this question. So Bob is a senior forest officer working on monitoring and assessment at the Ministry of Water and Environment of Uganda. He is a forest policy specialist and a climate change professional, and he coordinates the National Forest Monitoring System of Uganda. Bob, great to have you. So how does Uganda benefit from the better data? Over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just very quickly, uh, first to appreciate uh, our invitation to participate in this webinar. That's very, very important. Uh, very quickly, Uganda successfully completed its red plus readiness phase and uh, with all the required elements uh, that include the frail, the strategy and action plan, the national forest monitoring system, and all the other supportive frameworks like the beneficiary arrangement, the feedback grievance redress mechanisms. So all those are in place. And the, very interestingly also, Uganda was on a voluntary basis, the first country, you know, uh, through technical annex to the BUR to submit results for Red Plus in April 2020. And they will call that during the technical assessment by UNFCCC team of experts, it was appreciated that beta data, which means the accurate data and data that is showing consistency in the application of methodologies, uh, is fundamental in participating in results-based, for example, uh, but also in increasing confidence, not only in the results, but also in the engagement of partners who are interested in engaging with the country during the reserves-based payments phase. 
So working towards better data is key to have confidence to share data and of course enhance the transparency requirements for that data uh, as, as we see under the ETF of the Paris Agreement. And very importantly also capacity building of the technical teams in the country is undertaken when we demonstrate the dire need to have better data. So that is how crucial it is for a country to look out for better data for its forest data. Briefly, thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much, Bob. That's fascinating to hear. So data paving the way to results-based payments, that's obviously a, a good motivation. Right, so let me turn now to my second panelist, which is Mr. Samyot Sangying from Thailand. Uh, Mr. Samyot just retired from the Department of National Parks, Wildlife and Plant Conservation, where he was head of the Forest Inventory and Assessment Division since 2016. He is a forest inventory expert and focal point coordinator of sustainable forest trade in the Lower Mekong Region project. Samya, welcome. So yeah. how thank does you. Thailand benefit from the better data over here? Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. Good evening from Thailand for everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce my country before. Uh, Thailand is at approximately of 51.3 million hectares and uh, for 32 is a forest. And uh, the majority of Thailand forests are conserved forests. Maybe may, uh, estimate approximately sixty-four uh, percent, and before the submit of less uh, of less hard for less different initial level, Thailand forestry sector was not included the nationally determined contribution due to the lack of data. Now. And after that, uh, Thailand collect data for less for a long time, for a long time about the uh, uh, focus, but we not focus in carbon, we focus in biodiversity and uh, carbon, uh, uh, stock of wood. Uh, but after the uh, Thailand collect forest data from national forest inventory, we, we call on Thai form. Uh, we have uh, from ITTO to interview uh, Thai form since uh, 20 silo T. The primary focus of Thai form is to inform in forest stock and biodiversity and since the first cycle is heavily focused on conserved forest. Uh, forest area is monitored since 1973 for Thailand, when it draws it to meet as 41%. Forest cover has decreased to 25% in 1998, but uh, before and have been increasing again since. More recently, forest monitoring are improved with remote sensing analysis. By improving in its national forest monitoring system and reporting to UNFCCCC, Thailand benefit from a better understanding of how forests contribute to climate action. The latest FIL and FIL submission confirm BUR report that the forest sector has been a uh, Sink of carbon at least in 20, uh, 2006. With the uh, new and more accurate data, Thailand is now aiming at adding the forest sector into the NDC in the future and emphasize uh, the role of forest as sink of carbon and send up to emission forest protection policy. With the better data, Thailand can move can more accurately understand the contribution of forest to Thailand mitigation target. Uh, better and more transparency data also help to formulate policy and measure to list Thailand objective of 45, uh, 40 percent forest cover in the future. That's uh, uh, the uh, about the uh, benefit from the better data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Samyat. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So if I understood correctly, the data you collected actually allowed you to formulate an NDC target. That's that's yeah. wonderful. That shows the very the importance of, uh, yes. of collecting all this data. Yes. Okay, okay. great. So, 
So let me, with that, let me uh, move over to the uh, the next panelist. Um, so we have with us also Mr. Eric Conan from Cote d'Ivoire. So Eric is the head of the MRV unit at Red Plus Permanent Executive Secretariat. Eric is a forest engineer specialized in remote sensing and GIS. Beyond remote sensing, he is a specialist in Red Plus, MRV, and greenhouse gas inventory for the forestry and other land uses sector. Now, Eric, how does Cote d'Ivoire benefit from better data? Over to you. Merci, Marieke. Thank you very much, Maria Kay. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to take the floor. Côte d'Ivoire is a country in Western Africa. There has been quite a lot of deforestation in our country. In recent decades, we have an economy based heavily on agriculture and uh, there's a lot of speculation in the cocoa industry as well. And improving the transparency and quality of forest data has contributed enormously to climate action in Cote d'Ivoire. The availability of robust data primarily on the main drivers of deforestation and forest degradation and on forest dynamics has provided decision makers with concrete information on forest resources. This information is accessible via the geo portal of the National Forest Monitoring System. This system was developed to improve visibility and access to forest data in Côte d'Ivoire. This was used for the production of technical reports in the framework of uh, Red Plus. And this system was also developed for the development of policy and strategy documents. These policy and strategy documents include the National Red Plus Strategy, the strategy for the preservation, rehabilitation and extension of forests, and the policy for the preservation, rehabilitation and extension of forests. In addition to all of this, the availability of this data has enabled our country to improve its system for monitoring progress in the fight against climate change particularly through the MRV system. This has enabled countries to harmonize data between the different technical reference reports. The forest baseline, national communications, biennial updated reports, and it's also helped us to have comparable elements of data that we can use in our system. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope everybody found the interpretation for following the, the seminar in, uh, in English. So um, wonderful, you said data on, on drivers of deforestation and degradation is being used to formulate strategies and, and policies. That's uh, wonderful to see that that data is being used. So with that, I'm moving to my uh, fourth or fourth panelist of today. And again, if uh, you want interpretation in English, you can use, you can click on the globe um, down. So our fourth panelist is Mr. Martir Gabriel vasquez Bus from Guatemala. So Martir is deputy manager of the National Institute of Forests in Guatemala. He's a forest engineer by formation, and before taking up his current function as deputy manager, he was director of forest industry and trade and director of sustainable forest management, always with the National Institute of Forest. Martir, can you tell us how Guatemala, Guatemala benefited from better data? Gracias, muchas gracias por la invitación a Thank you very much for inviting us. It's a pleasure for us as Guatemala to 
to share with you the benefits that we have seen. Firstly, the data that we have allows us to develop better policies and measures in search of both national and international progress in forestry. And it also allows us to assess the contribution of our forests in the framework of the climate change sphere. What we need is a base of data which helps us to generate information so that we can have further research. And this research needs to take into account uh, various aspects. We do have our own platform in Guatemala. This is called CIFQA. The data generated continues to grow and this data is starting to become accessible to the public and this allows everyone to uh, benefit from the data that we have been able to accumulate. I can even share the link in the chat if you like so that you can see all of this information that is available. I think this is one of the best elements that demonstrates the benefits that we have seen in our country, because we have a lot of data and we are putting this data out there so that the public can access all of this important information. All stakeholders to access the data for different purposes. That sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. So we're moving on with our panel discussion and let us go back to Uganda. So Bob, uh, you said Uganda is the first African country to submit REPLUS plus results. And it's also the first tropical country to make available its national forest inventory through FAO's food and agriculture microdata catalog. Now, can you tell us, was it difficult to achieve consensus on making the data available? And is there already a positive impact from reporting on sh and sharing this data? Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, what a great opportunity to, to have this kind of conversation. Uh, yes, uh, first to mention that data availability and access is always a huge uh, challenge in many countries. Uh, just like it is in Uganda. But uh, we've built upon the work and relationships that we've been having uh, since the time when we did the National Forest Inventory, the latest 2019, and uh, the biomass assessments. So the relationships and that work that we did, plus the lessons we learned there, uh, we enabled us actually to know how to access data from different players. And making the data available to the farm catalog, I must confess that uh, it took us some time, yes, but it was not as difficult because uh, the only thing we needed to do as uh, a country was to agree and take care of uh, what we call the confidentiality elements uh, pertaining to, to having data shared out there and to what use is it going to be put. And this kind of uh, aspect ushered us into the urgent need to concretize and initiate the preparation of the data sharing protocol. And this was also part of the CBIT uh, project work that we initiated. And we hope, of course, to have this data sharing protocol completed this year, 2022. And I must confess also that, uh, yes, many partners have provided us feedback. Uh, to my Ministry of Water and Environment, appreciating especially the partners who are involved in carbon uh, project development, uh, most of whom are civil society organizations and other agencies in the country. And they have actually appreciated our being 
you know, uh, among the first countries to share this data freely with the farm catalog, because it's a demonstration that our data is uh, better data, or rather our data has the accuracy and consistency elements uh, taken care of. So to me, I think it's, uh, uh, it is already impacting on how the partners in Uganda and even the people who want to finance carbon project development, development partners, others, have looked at Uganda. And I must say that we've received many requests, uh, including our participation in the LEAF coalition. Uh, some of you could be you know, conversant about the LEAF coalition and other developments in uh, carbon transactions that are going, uh, are going on across the globe, especially with the post uh, uh, COP26 and uh, uh, conversations about Article 6.2 and Article 6.4 and the others. So we have already impacted on, uh, on many people with being the first country to, to share this information. It raises confidence in our data. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much, Bob. We will definitely keep looking at, at Uganda. And, and yes, these are issues that, uh, that are shared in all, all countries, right? So it's great to, to learn from one another. So let me pose my second question, um, moving for this one to Cote d'Ivoire. So um, Eric, Cote d'Ivoire has been involved in Red Plus for many years now. And as you said just now, it has a very particular context where uh, cacao uh, can both be a driver of deforestation or a climate smart contribution to landscape restoration. So you have an active private sector with some zero deforestation claims and you participate in the carbon fund. Um, you also report to UNFCCC. Now, the question that then arises is, is it challenging to reconcile the data requirements and needs from these different actors? Eric. Merci, Marie-Kay. Has been a member of the Red Plus mechanism since 2011. And the preparation phase to implement the Red Plus mechanism started in 2014. The study on the drivers of deforestation identified agriculture, mainly cocoa, as the biggest driver of deforestation in Cote d'Ivoire. And as a result, different strategies for reducing deforestation and forest rehabilitation have identified the introduction of trees into the agricultural landscape through the practice of agroforestry as an element to improve forest carbon storage. To this end, several initiatives are underway at the national level and they incorporate various elements. These elements include the Cocoa and Forests Initiative, the Forest Investment Project, and the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Program around the Tai National Park. This is the biggest forest area in Côte d'Ivoire. This is also recognized by UNESCO. The improved transparency of forest data has made it possible to harmonize data in order to meet the challenges of meeting the often different and disparate requirements of data stakeholders, we put in place a platform which brings together all stakeholders. This platform first made it possible to raise awareness amongst stakeholders and to give stakeholders access to available data. And then it allowed us to identify their data needs in order to then enable them to plan their production with the aim of reducing 
wastage of time and resources that could uh, be caused by the duplication of existing data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, yeah, that must be challenging the space to, to hear that you managed to harmonize all that, that data. Um, so my next question will be for Mr. Samya. So Thailand is one of the few countries with multiple forest inventories. And more recently, the country has built its capacities on data analysis. Can you tell us more about how Thailand's experience in data collection and analysis will enhance your national forest monitoring system? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, for the question, uh, I, 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 I would like to answer you about the, for the first one, the Thailand received technical training and data analysis. Uh, it's helpful to improve reporting on climate action and for domestic purpose, such as a boost stock and biodiversity monitoring. For the second one is also held to shift from the original pop popularity, uh, popularity software. That's what designed for the first inventory cycle to open source solution like uh, uh, to integrate a usual for the inventory variable with new variable like carbon. And the third one, the, the inventory port location is also being revised to include support from both uh, conservation, conserve, and reserve forest to make uh, result more representative at the na national level. Uh, and Thailand puts more effort to relocate thought in order to increase forest dynamic in the future forest data analysis. Uh, and Thailand is also received support and remote sensing data analysis for detecting forest chain and which, F which F o FAO level macro region project is working on near real time forest monitoring. Uh, of these two help monitoring forest chain and improve understanding of carbon dynamic and reporting climate action while also helping with more traditional use of forest monitoring for woodstock and biodiversity also. That is uh, about the uh, question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very uh, interesting. Okay, now let's yeah. uh, move on to the next question. So the next question is for Guatemala, for Martir. So Guatemala is a, uh, a multicultural country with uh, at least 23 ethnic groups. Uh, now, you just told us that um, your country has a, a wide and strong experience in forest monitoring and that this, this data also helps to, um, to formulate your national policies um, related to climate action and forest restoration and conservation. So the question we now have is how are you integrating local communities in the institutionalization process of forest monitoring in Guatemala? Gracias nuevamente. Thank you once again. That's right. We have 23 ethnic groups in uh, Guatemala. This is a challenge because this represents 23 languages and cultures in our country. But I think this has been quite an enriching experience for us. We have good communication with the various ethnic groups in Guatemala. This has allowed us to not only gather all of the information that exists in these various areas around the country, this allows us to work hand in hand with communities. This is very important for us. It helps us to gather information. It helps us to raise awareness in local communities as to why we're actually gathering all of this data and information. We have incorporated very important 
things like, for example, the Mayan calendar and something else which is very important, I think, as an anecdote, which was very telling for us when it comes to the collaboration that we have with ethnic groups. We had an experience, uh, an experience uh, of uh, a situation where we had a forestry technician who was working in the field and she was in quite a remote and difficult area to access. She injured her knee and suffered hypothermia while she was working and the local community members helped her to come down from the mountain and to receive medical attention. I think this is an example of the solidarity that characterizes the Guatemalan communities. Some experiences and also great for countries among each other to, to hear these experiences. Um, but now we want to pass on to our, our next panelist. So also with us today is Ms. Namrata Patodia Rastogi from the Jeff Secretariat. So Namrata supports the Jeff portfolio for the CIBIT. She provides technical advice related to CIBIT and supports operational and technical aspects related to the CIBIT portfolio working with Jeff agencies to ensure delivery of impactful projects with CIBIT. So Namrata, first of all, welcome. The Thank CIBIT you. Trust Fund under the Global Environment Facility was created at the request of parties to help strengthen capacities of developing countries to meet the enhanced transparency requirements of the Paris Agreement. Concerning CIBIT lessons learned from the AFALU sector, what are the most common capacity building needs identified in CIPID country projects? Great, thank you so much, Marieke. Um, and thank you to FAO for inviting me to speak here. It's uh, exciting and it's been really interesting to hear from our previous speakers, especially the country counterparts um, and hearing their experiences, especially some of them are the CBIT national projects that I will be touching on in, in a few minutes. I have a couple of slides which I thought might be helpful to anchor the discussion. Um, and then I will just go quickly into the question that Marieke posed. Um, I thought it would be important for us to just uh, remind ourselves of what the capacity building initiative for transparency or CBIT is. As mentioned by Marieke, it was established uh, at the request of parties uh, to strengthen the institutional and technical capacities of developing countries, specifically to meet the Article 13 enhanced transparency requirements of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the CBIT has three specific objectives. Uh, the first is to strengthen national institutions in relation to the transparency related activities. The second is to provide relevant tools, training and assistance to meet um, the requirements of the Article 13. And the third is to assist in the improvement of transparency over time. And I think some of the interventions that we've heard before us, as well as from FAO, from Rocio, shows how several of the CBIT projects actually align very well with these objectives. A quick snapshot of the portfolio. Uh, since 2016, we've had uh, about 81 projects in the portfolio. Uh, 75 of them are national and just as I mentioned, Uganda, Guatemala, Cote d'Ivoire, as well as Thailand have CBIT projects. So those are the same those are included in those 75 national projects. There are five global projects of which there are two FAO global projects, the CBIT Forest and CBIT AFALU, which we have been talking about here, and then one regional project. Um, there's a total of about $130.8 million in resources allocated. And most of these CBIT projects I should mention are about $1.2 to $1.3 million. So they are medium-sized projects uh, in Jeff language. Um, we have good regional diversity. As you can see, we have several projects over 30 or 30 projects from Africa, um, good representation from the Latin American and Caribbean, uh, as well as Asia and ECA. 
Uh, and I must note here that we have uh, several projects from LDCs and SIDS. And even though this is related to the enhanced transparency framework, which provides LDCs and SIDS with the flexibility provisions, we find uh, a great engagement from these countries in terms of CBIT projects. So I, I do want to highlight this here. Um, the next point I want to make here, which I will again go into in my next slide, is the AFALU sector. It is a sector that is specifically addressed within the CBIT portfolio, about 37% of our projects. And I do want to mention to our participants here that as Jeff goes into its eighth replenishment period, we will continue to provide support to developing countries for the enhanced transparency framework through CBIT. Um, and to ensure that countries are able to report back through the biennial transparency report, the first of which are due in 2024, which we heard previously from our speakers. Uh, the GEF, along with CBIT, also provides support through its enabling activities, the national communications, the biennial update reports, and we have also have a modality now open for biennial transparency reports. So we invite countries, I think several of you are very familiar with these, but I thought it would be important to just highlight this. So now going into the specific question that Marieke posed for me in terms of capacity needs, and I have to say that my job has become a lot easier because uh, several of the countries have talked about these challenges and how they've overcome that and provided sort of their perspective perspectives on these challenges. I am looking at this from a portfolio perspective. So looking at the AFALU projects and those that address AFALU. So there are some projects within the CBIT uh, portfolio that are specifically only for the AFALU sector, some that are broader, but address AFALU as well. And as I mentioned before, there are about 37% of projects in the CBIT portfolio that are specifically addressing AFALU. And if you look at LDCs and SIDS specifically, that number goes up to about 41 of 42. So there's a clear need for, uh, for building capacities in the transparency sector. There's absolutely no doubt about that. The first challenge that I want to highlight here, and I think this has been mentioned by some of my colleagues, is the need for building robust institutional arrangements and coordination mechanisms. There's a lack of legal frameworks. Uh, there, there's no institutionalizing of transparency, and it tends to happen in a project-based or an ad hoc manner. So there's a lack of MOUs, or there's a lack of uh, focal points or established systems and processes. Um, specifically for the AFL, sector, we find that coordination is required not only among the sectors, agriculture and forestry, but also at the subsectoral level. And then at the various levels of national, subnational, local, we heard from a Guatemalan counterpart about how you need to engage communities and bring communities together and coordinate amongst them. And I think I want to sort of highlight this point because this is very particular to the AFALU sector where you do find that because of the rural and the remote nature of the sector, uh, data collection and reporting can be extremely challenging. For some of the higher tier methodologies, you need continuous reporting or a technical sophistication that might not be available in these communities and capacities need to be built accordingly. The next point I want to make within this is the lack of data availability. There's just not data available. When I look at some of the projects that come through, there's in the previous national communications or the GHG inventories, there's mention of data uh, in the energy sector, but there's no reporting from the AFALU sector. We see that sometimes. Or if data is available, it's extremely weak and not comprehensive enough. Sometimes the data challenge is that it is in hard copy format and the need is to digitize it. Uh, there's a lack of data archiving, IT systems, understanding how some of this will be used. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge, and I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm sure my country counterparts will agree with me, is the lack of capacities, the technical capacities. AFALU is a technically complex uh, sector. Uh, it, understanding the concepts and methodologies, the definitions, uh, undertaking uh, country um, country emission factors, uncertainty analysis, using the GIS tools and the georeferencing tools, and some of the tools that FAO has built, which is extremely, it was really heartening to hear a, you know, a comprehensive sort of overview from Rocio on the CBIT forest and what's it, what it's doing in terms of training, because that's what is needed really. And sometimes it's needed on the ground, 
sometimes the virtual format works and this is just an extremely complex sector and it's not about just providing a one-time training the, pr the process is continuous and the capacities need to be retained I think another aspect in the technical capacities is not just from the AFALU sector perspective, but also for countries, practitioners, officials, policymakers to understand what the ETF, what is the enhanced transparency framework, why is it important, how does that connect to the Paris Agreement, and then what are the elements, what are the, what are the more ambitious elements. So we see that some countries might have a national forest monitoring system, but is it still not able to meet the ETF requirements. Um, that are required. And then the third point, which I, which was really nice for me to hear uh, from several of our country colleagues on how they are using the data already to make decisions. Uh, usually in the CBIT uh, portfolio, we do find that we are building the capacities of countries to enable this, to build, uh, I think one colleague, I can't remember which country it was just mentioned about developing an open sort of uh, data system or a web portal, which would allow data to be uh, publicly uh, for public consumption. Uh, I think that's really important and uh, CBIT projects aim to, to build that. Right. And three other projects, I'm almost done, Marieke, give me one more minute. Uh, and three three other points that I want to just mention here is that some of the capacity needs is to build on existing initiatives like Red Plus. It's important to align to NDCs and specifically for the AFALU sector, incorporating the gender elements. So that's from my end. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the extra few minutes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Namrata. So let me go straight to the introduction of the of our last but not least final panelist, uh, because we're running a little bit over time. Uh, so today with us also is Ms. Yeni Wang from the UNFCCC Secretariat. So Yeni is a program officer in the Transparency Framework subprogram of the Mitigation Data and Analysis Program at the UNFCCC. She works on issues related to land use, land use change and forestry, and climate change in the Secretariat, and in particular, Red Plus and MRV. So Yeni, developing countries are making great progress on uh, an MRV of anthropogenic forest-related emissions and removals. Can you summarize what new reporting requirements are uh, coming at countries when they're moving towards the enhanced transparency framework? Thank you, Marika. Um, first of all, um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to colleagues uh, who are following this around the world. Good afternoon to colleagues in Rome. And thank you very much for inviting me and the UNFCCC to be part of this panel as part of the final webinar. Um, but, you know, most of all, after listening to the various panel members, it, I must say that it's a breath of fresh air to hear the experiences being shared by our colleagues from the various countries on the panel and the exciting things they're doing as they prepare to meet the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement. So um, it's really great to hear that countries, developing countries are moving forward. And I think the uh, e-learning module that has been developed by FAO on how uh, the importance of forest data, the importance of transparent forest data uh, will help countries go towards in fulfilling some of the objectives of the enhanced transparency framework. Uh, I will not elaborate on what the transparency framework is about. I think that has been said and, um, and only to build on some of the things that uh, our country panelists have mentioned, as well as Namrata. Thank you for uh, summarizing some of the capacity building needs. Uh, I can only concur. Uh, those needs are very important. Um, what are the new elements? I think um, we've heard that the ETF, Enhanced Transparency Framework, builds on the existing reporting and review processes of the convention. But yet there are a few new elements that countries would have to meet as they report under the Paris Agreement. Uh, they will be reporting in the form of a biennial transparency report and all parties will be making this report called the BTR. 
And in it, all parties will be providing information and data on their greenhouse gas emissions and removals. And the other thing that they need to report on is on how they are tracking progress in implementing and achieving their NDCs, their National Determined Contribution. They would have also to cover other information and data uh, that would be related to climate change impacts and adaptation and what are the information that relates to their financial technology capacity building needs and particularly uh, for developing countries and the support that uh, developed countries are providing. So um, as you know that in Glasgow at COP26 last, uh, last year, that the COP finalized the provisions, the guidance for operationalizing these uh, modalities that were agreed that uh, guides the reporting under the ETF uh, of the Paris Agreement. Um, we know what is the benefit of the need for transparency in data and information, particularly for the forest sector. We've already heard some of the um, examples provided by our colleagues um, that, uh, you know, um, it helps in Cote d'Ivoire, it helps them identify drivers of deforestation when you would have transparent data uh, that would go into part of your developing your national strategy and um, the need for data platforms in managing such data. Um, it not only leads to transparency, but I think uh, it is also being transparent to all stakeholders who are involved and part of good communication. I think Guatemala summarized it very well on how they are getting their stakeholders involved. So these are some of the benefits that a transparent data and information, which includes the forest sector, uh, leads to better national planning, uh, helping countries develop their plans and strategies, in particular in how they would meet their nationally determined contribution. And um, such transparent data and information will also help countries identify what their capacity building needs are and facilitate them on assessing support for these capacity building needs. So in short, I would say transparent data would help meet country, help countries to meet their commitments to uh, on what they identified for the NDCs. And it, it also helps build confidence and trust among countries uh, of their climate actions by having transparent data and information, which we also heard that is important to have a system where such data and information will be managed and coordinated and being accessible by all the relevant stakeholders in the country. Um, I, on the capacity building needs, I think uh, Namrata summarized it very well. Uh, there was a CGE a study done about two, three years back, and the elements that were identified for CBIT projects, I think um, it was also identified by the CGE in their study of capacity building needs, which apply to the AFALU or red plus sectors. So um, I guess in a way that sort of summarizes um, what I would like to say in answering in terms of the new elements that countries have to report and robust institutional arrangement. It may not be new, new, but you would definitely need that. And I think we've heard those examples by our panelists. And Namrata has also emphasized on that fact that the, the very importance of robust institutional arrangement. And so I can only end by saying, you know, um, is for countries to start now and take action already now to ensure that you would be ready uh, when the time comes uh, for reporting under the Paris Agreement, under the ETF, uh, and preparing for your uh, biennial transparency report. Thank you, Marika. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Yeni.
So unfortunately, we've run a little bit over with time. So the, the Q&A, the live Q&A will be somewhat shorter. But as you can see, a lot of uh, questions have already been answered in written. So uh, we always also we will answer all the questions in written that will become online later. So even if we don't manage right now, uh, an answer will be coming. So um, let me just try and pick uh, one question. I saw there were many questions for Guatemala, which Martir already answered in written. Um, I have a question here for, uh, for Uganda. Uh, so Bob, the question here is, what kind of institutional arrangements did FAO put in place in Uganda to promote the data dissemination? It's a question from Cleto. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great question indeed, I must say. Uh, Uganda went through a very rigorous uh, process to you know, implement a project that we named Institutionalization of the National Forest Monitoring System. Uh, you know, the name of that project tells it all uh, what is contained in that report. And in that report, we identified uh, the institutions that are relevant for data, both collection analysis and all the other technical aspects related to data, and also coordination functions for data management uh, in the country. And the institutions I could just mention very quickly here include the Ministry of Water and Environment, which is uh, doing the coordination function, the National Forest Authority, which is doing most of the technical elements, data collection analysis, the Climate Change Department, which has a function to report uh, to the UNFCCC for the GHGI. And you know very well that the FOLU contributes to the GHGI uh, you know, reporting. We have the local governments. These are the concentrated or the congested structures uh, in uh, across the country, the administrative structures across the country. They also participate in data collection. We have the private sector, which provides information. It has, we have a robust private sector in the country, which has undertaken commercial tree growing. And we have, I mean, it provides data to the system. And all these institutions have been brought on the same table to have a conversation on uh, how do we initiate a data sharing protocol. And uh, we still have some work to do to complete that data sharing protocol. So we have institutionalized the National Forest Monitoring System and its functionality. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you very much. And uh, maybe to mention the report is available. I asked Leto for his email address so that I can, uh, you know, I can share that report uh, immediately. I'm just waiting, thank you. Perfect, yeah, I'm sure we will make that connection. Okay, wonderful. There are so many other questions. Uh, it's really hard to, <laughs> to select them. So uh, yeah, I see Benin also interested in learning from Cote d'Ivoire, wonderful. Um, let me see if I can take another question here. Maybe I would pose one live to Guatemala as they had a lot of questions. So I have here a question, um, which is actually to all countries from uh, Pedro Montero. Apart from the opportunities and tools, could any of the panelists elaborate on eventual overarching challenges identified during the process in different countries? Martir, do you want to respond to that question? Eh, claro, me podrías repetir la pregunta, disculpa? Yes. Apart from the opportunities and tools, could any of the panelists elaborate on eventual overarching challenges identified during the process in different countries? Gracias. Yo creo que parte de los desafíos generales. Thank you. I think, I think that uh, some of the general challenges include issues relating, relating to technology. There are many forms of technology available, but for the forestry sector, it's uh, really technology that is just starting, we're starting to adopt it and adapt it. We are doing this now, and it is one of the serious challenges. And then we also have the issue of 
in achieving greater participation with the communities and particularly among women in the forestry sector. I believe that these are issues which are incredibly important and we are addressing them with an agenda strategy with participation, not only within our institution, but also with all of the other national services that we work with. And we try to stress the importance of this um, and we are stressing it across the board in several different areas. Uh, the uh, participation of women and communities is incredibly important. I can see it. Okay, so with that, I think we need to uh, move on in our schedule and uh, we will continue again going in writing uh, with, with the question, but we also do not want to miss our, uh, our last speaker, of course. So um, with us today is uh, also Mr. Ansi Pekarinen, uh, who will give us a few closing remarks. So Ansi is a team leader of the Global Forest Resources Assessment Team. Thank you for being with us, Ansi, and over to you. Thank you, Marike. And dear colleagues, let me start by thanking you all for having here been here with us today and for the rich discussion that we have had. A special thanks, of course, go to our speakers who have shared their insights on the ongoing efforts and future needs to improve the transparency of forest-related data and information to meet the requirements of the Paris Agreement. But let me just try to summarize the session we just had. We started, with a studied the technical program with Rosia's overview of the novel learning resources and activities developed during the CBIT Forest Project. Let me just remind you that these materials will continue to be available online for the foreseeable future. We hope that you will find them useful and can help us to share them through your own professional networks. After OSEA, we have heard from our colleagues from countries how the CBIAT, CBIAT pilot uh, have worked to increase the transparency of national forest data. In Uganda, transparency has been increased by sharing data across several forums and that has paved the road for results-based payments. Uganda has also made excellent progress by sharing their NFI data, data through the FAO microdata catalog. Thailand has improved the statistical analysis and quality of the data and statistics, including using remote sensing to better inform the formulation of the NDCs and achieving the national policy objectives. In Cote d'Ivoire, the better data has provided accessible and concrete information on forest resources and their changes, including on drivers of deforestation. The build system also supports development of policy and strategy documents, and great progress has been made in improving the transparency of forest data, harmonizing them, and reconciling the data requirements and needs from different actors. Also in Guatemala, progress has been made in producing and sharing better data, which are now becoming accessible also to the general public. Good progress has also been made in gathering information from different parts of the country through collaboration and involvement of the 23, if I recall right, local communities in forest monitoring process. Many thanks to Mr. Kazungu, Mr. San Jin, Mr. Conan and Mr. Vasquez for having shared these insights with us today. In addition to these encouraging country examples, we have also learned from uh, Ms. Namrata Patogia Rastochi about the CHEF's impressive CBIT portfolio and specific capacity building needs in the technically complex agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector. Lack of data, technical capacity, and coordination clearly remain issues that we need to continue to address. And finally, we enjoyed the insights of uh, Ms. Jenny Wong from the UNFCCC on the new reporting requirements for countries moving to enhanced uh, transparency framework under the Paris Agreement. We also heard how transparent data helps countries to meet their NDCs and leads to better identification of capacity building needs and assessing the support needed. Many thanks uh, Namrat and Jenny for having shared your valuable knowledge and experiences on these matters. At the FAO, we stand ready to apply the recommendations and lessons learned from this project to further contribute to the improvement of forest data transparency and sustainability at both national and global levels. As my colleague Julian Fox said earlier, during the past years, we have strengthened our support to national forest monitoring efforts around the world. 
The resulting national forest monitoring systems and the data they produce are, are the cornerstones of reliable, credible and transparent reporting for national and international reporting needs. We will also continue our work on improving the quality, accessibility and transparency of the global data on forest resources, as we are mo now moving towards the next, next Global Forest Resources Assessment FRA 2025, as we call it. At this very moment, we are preparing a proposal for the scope of the next assessment. And while continuing our efforts to further reduce the reporting burden, we are also working on a more flexible reporting process. That will allow more frequent voluntary updates of key forest-related indicators as a response to the evolving information needs of the international policy arena, the Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, and forthcoming post-2020 biodiversity framework, among others. We are also planning to further strengthen our collaboration with other forest-related reporting processes to ensure better alignment and information exchange among the national focal points. And finally, we will continue the work on the open access online global forest resources assessment platform to facilitate the country reporting process and to make it easier for the FRA national correspondents to visualize and use different sources of information. This will help to better understand inconsistencies in different data sets, explaining those differences in an explicit way and harmonizing the data reported to different processes and conventions. Colleagues, before closing, I would like to use this opportunity to thank Rocio and our colleagues at the FAO eLearning Academy for having organized the event, Marieke for the excellent moderation, and the Global Environment Facility for the financial support that helped us to implement all these presented activities. I hope today's discussion have, have inspired, discussions have inspired us all to take further steps towards transparent production and dissemination of forest-related data. Climate change is a real threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. And halting deforestation and reducing forest and land degradation are among the best nature-based solutions to the climate crisis. With better and transparent data on forests, we can make better decisions. Decisions that will help us to conserve and use our forests in a way that secures sustainable future for us and for the planet. Thank you all. Stay safe and have a great rest of the day. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ansi, for those wonderful closing remarks. Maybe just as a very last, uh, um, every panelist can turn on their camera. We can make a little photo of, uh, of all panelists together. And thank you, everybody, again, for joining today from your different time zones. And the recordings will be made available and also the Questions will be answered and will be published online as well. Thank you very much. Do we have everybody? Okay, I hope our technical uh, colleagues <laughs> managed to take a photo. Colleague from Meeting Service, can you please uh, put us in gallery view so that we can take a picture? Thank you. Oh, okay, okay, I took a screenshot. I, great. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Many thanks and have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.